Hello, my name is Lindsay Montanari and I lead the academic program here at Groby Optimization. Thanks so much for joining us today for Where Data Meets Decisions, where we're going to be introducing three new Python notebook examples that combine machine learning and mathematical optimization. I want to quickly touch on the intended audiences for today's webinar. This is a session that's going to cover three approaches to combining machine learning and optimization. And it's not just for data scientists or OR scientists. It's also not just for academic users or practitioners. Each of these audiences can hopefully get something out of the session today. First, if you're a data scientist who's interested in learning more about optimization, the examples we're going to present might help you understand how to add optimization to your machine learning model to help with complex decision making. If you're an academic user and still learning optimization, these are digestible examples of how optimization can touch day-to-day -day life. See how to create tools that blend the predictive power of data science with the decision-making power of optimization. And finally, if you're an experienced optimization practitioner, these are easy to present examples that could be the start of a conversation with your colleagues. As we dive into the examples, sit back and consider if you might be able to help a colleague, team, or friend get started with optimization using some of these free educational resources. Anyone who's interested in either learning about or instructing other problem solvers on the benefits of combining data science and optimization are going to be able to leverage these new examples. They're part of our example library online at groby.com, and they're available for use for free in classroom or training contexts. So today's webinar is part of a series shining the spotlight on our academic community and some of the new educational resources that we've been hard at work developing to help new learners understand the impact of optimization. Today, we're thrilled to hear from the data science team here at Garobi, Jerry Yurchison and Rahul Swamy. Jerry has over 10 years experience applying operations research, machine learning, statistics, and visualization to improve decision making. Before joining us here at Garobi, Jerry was a senior consultant at On Location Inc. He worked as a data scientist for Booz Allen, and he also has several years of experience teaching a wide variety of college-level math and statistics courses. Jerry holds a BS, Education, and MS degree from Ohio University in Mathematics, and an MS in Operations Research and Statistics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Rahul is our data science intern working with the academic program at Groby. He's a current PhD candidate in industrial engineering at the University of Illinois Ur Urbana-Champaign. Rahul is also an active member of Informs, and he spent two years as the lead editor of Informs ORMS Tomorrow. He's passionate about the intersection between operations research and data science, and has spent the summer working with us to develop educational resources that focus on providing data science students a starting point with prescriptive analytics. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask any questions you might have in the Q&A feature of Zoom. If we can't respond to your questions directly or during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar, we'll make sure to respond to you individually shortly after the session. Thanks so much, and looking forward to hearing from Rahul and Jerry. Over to you. Thanks for that great introduction, Lindsay. I'm Jerry Yurchison, Data Science Strategist for Groby Optimization, and I'm going to start off by talking about our notebook example library. So no matter if this is the first you've heard of mathematical optimization or if it's something that you've worked on for years already, uh, we have a wide range of examples that will sort of fit any skill set, any level of experience. And we also try in each of our examples, try and hit on key features of Groby itself, the solver itself, and our Python API. So if there's something you're trying to, a specific thing you're trying to learn, we'll have uh, an example that can help you understand it. Many of our examples are sort of more traditional operations research examples to really help you understand how mathematical optimization works. We've been recently expanding our library to combine uh, predictive analytics with prescriptive to sort of show how data science and mathematical optimization can really work well together. So this provides you a great way to experiment and learn with mathematical optimization. Again, no matter where you are in experience or what you're looking to do, uh, there will there'll be some examples to help you out. And also, our examples cover numerous industries. So no matter what you're into, what your interests are, there will be something that will be fun for you to look at. So things like uh, airlines or telecommunications, healthcare, energy and utilities, no matter what financial services, which is something that's you know really interesting and hot now, 
no matter what your interests are, there's going to be something that's going to uh, pique your interest and get you going. So in the previous slide, I used the phrase um, from data to decision. And part of the title of this talk is where data meets decisions. You may have seen a figure similar to what just popped up on the screen. So taking a look at this, sort of the parts that are in blue are your typical responsibilities for a data scientist and the questions that those responsibilities tend to answer. So doing descriptive analytics for what already happened. You'll see diagnostic analytics for why did it happen and then predictive analytics for what's going to happen next. But notice that there isn't anything about what decisions to make. So if you think about a simple example, if you told me the probability of rain tomorrow, my decision of whether to bike to work or to drive to work might be pretty easy. But business decisions aren't like that. And predictive models may only give you part of the solution that you're looking for. So here's an interesting tidbit from Gartner. Uh, from an article that they published in 2021 about how to make better business decisions. They said that 65% of decisions made now are more complex by involving more stakeholders or more overall choices than they were two years ago. So this figure shows how optimization modeling can add more value to the data science projects that you're working on by letting you model the whole problem, you know, going from data to decision. And what's also to uh, also important to note here is that you don't have to go th through this uh, diagram necessarily in sequence. Mathematical optimization, optimization modeling doesn't require predictive analytics you know going into it or you don't have to have a mastery of that. It certainly would make your optimization model better if you have super high confidence in the values that go into it but optimization modeling can be done anywhere along the analytical maturity model here so even if you're just starting uh, you can get going with optimization modeling just by understanding what your what your business problem really is. Um, so now that we've talked about how mathematical optimization can add value to and really complement data science projects, let's get into a super fast, uh, lightning fast introduction of what mathematical optimization is. Uh, it's something that falls under um, a more umbrella terms like prescriptive analytics or decision intelligence. And it's something that has sort of three key characteristics. Uh, first is that there are decisions to be made, and the number of possibilities is sometimes really, really large. And I'm not talking about uh, you know hundreds or thousands of possibilities. I'm talking about you know the number of grains of sand on Earth, or the number of atoms in the universe. That type of huge. Uh, so some decisions decisions may not be allowed. So if you're thinking of like an advertising campaign, you can't buy every advertising slot on every TV station. Some decisions are quantifiably better than others. So the revenue from this decision may be uh, more than making this other decision. So you can definitely rank them. Uh, some key uh, other key aspects of mathematical optimization is that it is, in fact, very scalable with improvements in algorithms and improvements in hardware, problems that, you know, that, we, that couldn't be solved just several years ago now solve lightning fast. It is a super versatile way of modeling. It's not case specific or, or industry specific. And sort of uh, two slides ago, I talked about all of the industries that our examples hit. That, you know, that just shows how versatile this is. And it guarantees two things. One is that the solution is actually doable, it's feasible, and that it is provably optimal. And that's something that uh, sort of things like heuristics or other sort of decision uh, analytics processes really can't guarantee. So to relate the key characteristics to common building blocks that you'll see throughout our notebooks, uh, one, uh, one of the key building blocks are decision variables. And these sort of come in three flavors. One uh, is a continuous decision variable, which is something along the lines of like um, uh, the amount of a chemical that goes into a compound. Um, next, we have integer variables. So if you're talking about advertising uh, slots that you want to buy, you can't buy 3.5. You can buy 3 or you can buy 4. And lastly, we have binary uh, decision variables. So these are sort of like on-off switches, yes-no decisions. So yes, uh, I will. Um, build a new warehouse in this location or no I won't. Next we have constraints 
um, which these are the relationships that the variables have to satisfy. And then lastly, we have what we call an objective function. And this is what's to be maximized or minimized. So essentially, you create an expression for, let's say, revenue. And this would be what you want to more or less, more likely have maximized. And it's an expression that uh, is built from the decision variables. And in each notebook that we have, uh, we'll go through these building blocks um, extensively and, and have a thorough definition so you can really understand what's going on. So uh, that's it for me for now. I'm going to throw it over to you, Rahul, to talk about the three notebooks we're going to cover. Thank you, Jerry, for that wonderful introduction to mathematical optimization. In this part of the webinar, we'll be looking at three new notebooks that are added to the Groby Data Science Library. The first example is a music recommendation system that combines collaborative filtering and an integer program. Next, we'll see how to select an optimal basketball lineup using regression and integer programs. Finally, we'll see how to set optimal avocado prices using regression and a quadratic program. So what is a recommendation system? It's just a technology that recommends products to users, and we see this everywhere. It could be Netflix recommending movies, Spotify recommending music or artists, it could be YouTube recommending videos or Facebook recommending new friends. It's all over the place. Um, so what are some common techniques that use, uh, uh, that, that do recommendations? The classical method is called um, is collaborative filtering. So here the idea is to look at partial information from users. So for some users, we know which movies they've seen in this figure. So the question is, um, what new movies can we recommend, right? So the, the, the method essentially factorizes this matrix into two smaller matrices. It's called matrix factorization and learns from uh, similar users uh, what a user might be interested in. And typically the output is a preference score among the unknown products for each user and uh, the higher the score, the more likely this user is could like that product. A movie, a song, could be anything. Um, so typically, the you know the end product from this data science pipeline would be, or the prediction pipeline would be, here are the top products that this user could be into. But what if we if we have some more constraints that we'd like to incorporate to the recommendation, and that is where the true power of mathematical optimization could be best leveraged. So we, now we're gonna look at how to use integer programming to select the best or the optimal um, uh, recommendation, particularly for a music recommendation system. So the goal is to first predict the preferences using collaborative filtering and using these predictions to optimize um, for the you know the final recommended set. Let's look at the notebook. We'll look at how to select a music recommendation using mathematical optimization. So we'll use data set from Spotify, which has information on users and their um, playlists. So this is encrypted and comes from a research paper. And we'll also use information on music artists and their popularity from Music Brains and Last.fm. FM. Let's get started. So first, let's look at what the data looks like. So here you see um, the top few artists in terms of their popularity. Um, and surprisingly, we have Coldplay, Radiohead, and so on. We can also plot the popularity across the artists. So yeah, we see some kind of an exponential curve. <clears throat> we can also see where these artists are from. So most of the artists, it seems to be 
um, from the data set, it seems like they're from the United States, United Kingdom, Sweden, Spain, Canada. Uh, but, in, but overall, we have 100 countries from which these artists are from. So the question is, how can we create, make sure that the recommendations um, eventually are going to be diverse in terms of you know, the country of origin and the popularity. So that's the goal of uh, the recommendation we're trying to build. So we also know every user and, um, you know, we have about 1,000 users in this data set and their playlists. So we know what songs they like or listen to and what artists they like. So here you only see artists, sorry, users that like Elvis Costello. Um, but yeah, so there are also 4,000 artists, sorry, 8,000 artists. So yeah, as we saw earlier, with the first part of the problem is to construct a prediction model using collaborative filtering. The goal is to learn the preference of new artists for each user. And uh, we're going to use this package called LightFM, and this is an open source package. And uh, yeah, so basically we put in the input into a pandas data frame and uh, train the model. And uh, for these hyperparameters, um, we have a pretty good accuracy with splitting the training and the test set. You can also feel free to experiment with this. You can try other hyperparameters. You can also try uh, cross-validation with using a third subset of data. Um, yeah. So having learned the model, we can start predicting, right? So for each user, so we have about thousand users. So here, uh, this this is functionality where you can select a user. So here, for example, we have user zero, and they currently like these artists. Okay. So the question is, what new artists they might might they like? So this is what the recommendation looks like purely from the collaborator filtering. So it says, uh, well, so these are the artists they might like based on similar other users to this user. And uh, for each artist, we have a preference score. So this gives an uh, indication of uh, how likely, um, you know, this user might like this artist. The closer to one, the better. You can try for other users. Um, yeah. So this user likes these artists and therefore the model says, oh, they're most likely going to like Arctic monkeys. Something we notice in just this, you know, this output is that most of the artists come from this, the same few countries, the United States and so on. And also we see that the artists are all very popular. They all have at least a million uh, followers, right? So how can we create a more niche playlist? So we're gonna address this using mathematical optimization, using constraints. So as Jerry mentioned, there are many components to a mathematical optimizing, uh, optimization model. Um, you know, so there's the objective function that we're trying to maximize or minimize. Um, so in, the, in our case, we're going to maximize the uh, preference of the selected artists. Okay, the key decision variable is whether or not we select an artist. Okay, so yeah, so that's the goal of the optimization model. So the inputs are from the collaborative filtering. So you know, for each artist, what's the user's preference score, and uh, we know the popularity and we know the number of artists we want to choose in the recommendation. Um, we also are gonna fix a maximum limit on the average popularity on the users. So these two are uh, inputs that we provide to the model and say, hey, find me a recommendation whose average popularity is not beyond this value that we fix, okay? For example, we can say the average popularity should be 500,000 listeners. Um, if you make it 100,000 listeners, then the recommendation is going to be even less popular. So, yeah. So this is something we can play around with. 
like I said, the decision variable here is to choose an artist. So here XA is what's called a binary decision variable, which takes a value one if we include artist A and takes a value zero if we don't include him or her. So first we're gonna set the objective function, which is to maximize the total preference, right? For each, each user, we want the recommendation to be likable. For, and this comes from the collaboration filtering. And uh, yeah, so the constraints are as follows. First, we make sure that the total popularity um, is not beyond a certain value, right? So that's, um, that's, that's basically what we set as a constraint here. Uh, notice that here, uh, you know, to put these constraints and objectives into the model, it's as simple as just initiating a Groby uh, model and adding these uh, constraints and objective uh, in a single line. So, yeah, you can look at Groby's other functional ways to write these constraints and objectives. We can also set a size constraint. Uh, the idea being we want to fix exactly n number of artists, right? So let's say we want exactly 30 artists. So we can say the sum of XA's should be equal to n, right? Yeah, so, so far we have built the model. So we're gonna tell Groby to start optimizing. So it's as simple as saying m.optimize. And once we do that, uh, Groby will run the optimizer. And here you see uh, the output from the algorithm that Groby uses. Yeah. And over here we see the optimization, you know, the optimal solution. So here uh, the, the popularity is, you know, kind of gone down, right? So we want less popular artists. So here the average popularity is set to 500,000 followers. And so there are some highly popular artists with a uh, million users, followers, and there are some with um, only 17,000 followers, right? So we are able to achieve the goal of, uh, you know, creating a more niche uh, recommendation using constraint. Um, but notice that we, we still have, you know, not a very good diversity in terms of the country. Um, we see a lot of US and UK, and let's say you're interested in creating an even more international, internationally diverse recommendation. So you can add some more constraints to achieve that. So we can create some new variables um, for uh, countries being represented. So here, YC uh, takes a value one if a country is represented, uh, or, or rather, uh, if it's not represented, uh, the YC will take the value zero. So we can write that using an inequality. So essentially, if you add all the XAs, where A is the set of all, comes from the set of all artists from a country C, then this value, if it's zero, that means country C is not represented at all, in which case YC will be zero because the right-hand side is zero. And this is a very simple linear equation that you can add to the Groby model. And, uh, and then we can say, well, the sum of all countries represented should be greater than some value that I input. Let's say out of the 30 artists, I want 20 countries to be represented. You can then set C min to be 20. So once again, you can add that to the Groby model and set it to optimize. And yeah, so this is the optimal solution. So here we see 20 countries being represented over here. Um, this plot shows um, where the preference and the popularity for the artists are. You can see a good mix of popularity and you also see the different colors for the 20 different countries. And so here in this cell, you have the whole code, Groby code. And uh, what you can do is you can toggle the pop, the average popularity parameter. Let me zoom out a bit. And you'll notice that as you decrease the average popularity, 
um, your you know your recommendation gets less and less popular and the preference also goes down but not too much so here is the least popular um, playlist you can come up with and then as you keep increasing popularity you get a more uh, more popular playlist I think this is what we started with um, yeah so this is as if there's no constraint at all if you set a very high value um, so I think these have no international diversity so let's say we said we want all artists to be completely from different countries so here each and every artist comes from a different country we can also achieve that so yes so from this example we saw how to combine collaborative filtering and integer program to create a powerful recommendation system for niche music artists. Over to you, Jerry. Uh, thanks, Rahul, for that super interesting example of how to use mathematical optimization to build uh, interesting and unique recommendation systems. I'm going to switch topics and talk about building optimal lineups uh, in fantasy sports. And if you're not familiar with the topic, here is a super quick introduction. Uh, fantasy sports are online competitions where you build dream teams of uh, real-life players across a set of real-life games. Traditionally, you know, sports like football, basketball, and baseball, ha they already have a huge fantasy uh, community. Other sports like soccer and hockey are, are definitely getting there. Even esports like uh, League of Le Legends competitions or Call of Duty, you can find fantasy uh, competitions for those as well. Um, but the common thread for each of these uh, competitions is that players' performances are distilled to what we call fantasy points. So you sort of add up all the box scores in a certain way, and uh, what comes out is uh, one number, one fantasy points number for how uh, that player did in that game. Uh, other common uh, sort of rules for fantasy sports competitions is you have to sort of satisfy what we call positional requirements. So we're going to talk about a fantasy basketball example. So you need to have a certain, you need to have a shooting guard, you need to have a point guard, you need to have a center, uh, and you need to have a small forward and a power forward. So you need to, you need to select players that fulfill certain positional requirements. Um, there's also a salary cap, which has nothing to do with actual player salaries, but um, the, the sites that run these competitions assign a salary value to each player, and you, need, you have a certain cap that you can't go past. So you can't just be selecting the, the best players all the time. You need to have some, uh, some knowledge of the game in order to select some players that you think are going to do, do super well given the fact that they're not, um, they don't have like the highest following or the highest salary. Um, you can definitely play fantasy sports for fun. You don't have to invest any money in it, but if uh, you, th you feel you're good enough, then you definitely can. Um, and there are some pretty big competitions out there. Uh, because of that, you know, that you can play for fun, you can play for money, fantasy sports is extremely popular. Uh, estimated 60 million users way back in 2017, so that, that number has definitely increased since then. And the market value globally is estimated to be $20 billion dollars. Uh, this year. And you might be thinking that, well, if I'm really good at forecasting uh, what players are going to do and I know exactly, you know, the, how, you know, ex exactly the fantasy points that each of these uh, players are going to score, that creating an optimal lineup is super easy. Well, it's not. And uh, we're going to jump into a, a notebook example about fantasy basketball and creating an optimal lineup. And we're going to see that uh, that it's really not as straightforward as you might think. So off to the notebook. In this example, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, historical NBA data and build a forecasting model to forecast and predict uh, future uh, fantasy point output for individual players for a particular day, and then use that forecast to build an optimal fantasy basketball lineup. Uh, typical for our examples, we start off with a brief introduction, going over the objectives, prerequisites, problem statement, and our solution approach, just to make sure that you understand everything that's going in and, and that you're all ready to go. 
So uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're going to be first be uh, building a fantasy points forecast and then a lineup optimization model. Uh, I'm going to go super fast through the forecasting aspect of it to focus on the optimization part. I'll, hi I'll hit on a few key points. Uh, the data that we used is uh, from Kaggle, uh, and you can have sort of take a look at it there through those links. Uh, we did a little bit of exploratory data analysis some visualization just to see what what some relationships may be between some of our uh, some of the columns in the data and fantasy points. Uh, one key thing that I'll hit on here is the the features that we uh, use for uh, for this predictive model and how we sort of derive them. <clears throat> we didn't just use the you know the straight columns that are in the data. What we did was we created a three game running average of key box score statistics. So things like points, assists, turnover, steals, blocks, things that impact sort of fantasy scores. Uh, did a three game running average and then would use that value uh, as, as uh, one of our features to predict the fantasy points for the next game. Here we have a you know, correlation heat map of our sort of moving average features to see which ones may be highly correlated. And we do fit uh, three different models. We have a uh, sort of a basic linear regression model, a neural network, and a uh, gradient boosted tree method of, of, uh, of regression. And we sort of see that the gradient boost slightly does the uh, best of the three, but they all perform quite similarly. And visualizing some of the output. And here's where we uh, append the uh, predicted points to the uh, current data set that we have. So this, when you look at this data, you see player, position, uh, team, opponent, which those two things aren't really super relevant, but uh, salary and reminding that the salary is uh, a value that is determined by the site that runs the competition. Not, it's not actual salaries or anything. Um, but now we've added on two columns. One is the predicted fantasy points from our model, and then one is uh, points per salary ratio, which takes the fantasy points, divides by the salary, and we multiply it by a thousand to put it in thousands. Um, so you might be thinking, all right, let's fill out this optimal lineup. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to fill this out in a, what we call a greedy fashion. I'm going to sort from uh, you know highest to lowest of my predicted fantasy points and just start start from the top because you know those guys th those players got to be in the lineup if they have the most predicted fantasy points. Well, um, so for this model, what we're and this is a simplified version of a fantasy basketball model for right now. Um, we're going to be selecting one player from each position of the five major positions uh, in basketball, and we're also imposing on ourselves a salary cap of $30,000. So let's take those two bits of information uh, into account and sort of go from top to bottom making our team. So our first player, Joel Embiid, has the highest predicted fantasy points. Let's add him to the lineup. James Harden, point guard. Uh, let's add him to the lineup, no problem. But then already and our third player you know we're going to add lebron james and uh we, we've already violated our salary cap we're already over the thirty thousand dollars that we've allotted to to fill out this team after just three players so we can't even just simply go but go down and and add uh and, and add players in a sort of sequential fashion and you might be thinking all right well let's go the next uh shooting forward um, pardon me, uh, small forward. Uh, and that's Kevin Durant, still over. <laughs> um, maybe Kyle Kuzma would fit in there, maybe. So we're sort of seeing that this is already a complicated problem. So you might be thinking, all right, well, let's, let's use the points per salary ratio. And I'm going to sort by that real fast. And I just want to highlight the names that sort of pop up to the top. Jordan Bell and Josh Hart. So let's let's put those names in the back of our mind and see what happens at the end when we have our optimal lineup. And one other thing I want to mention is that there, even in this super simple problem, we have over two million possible lineups, given the number of uh, the number of players we have at each individual position. So it's for a very simple problem, two million is a lot. And when you have actual more like real life problems. <laughs> You know, business problems. You're going to have a lot more possible combinations. Like I said before, you know, like number of grains of sand in the uh, on beaches and earth. You know, that's that 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 type of number. 
So uh, what I talk about next is some of the, let's start building this optimization model. So talk about the parameters and the variables, all of the, the building blocks that I mentioned before. So um, we're gonna build, we're gonna first start by defining our decision variables. And our decision variables, like I mentioned earlier as well, are, these are going to be binary. Yes, no decisions, on off switches. You know, is this player going to be in our lineup? Yes or no. Uh, and when you see that subscript I, that means, you know, the subscript I represents the, the individual players. So YI is, you know, is a, a particular variable for a particular player. Yes or no, are they going to be in, in our lineup? So we add our decision variables. Let's talk about our objective function. So our objective function is to maximize the total number of fantasy points. We want the highest number there, so it makes sense that that's our overall objective. And we can identify the amount of points that a player will contribute to our lineup by PI, which is the points for the individual, times YI. So if YI is 1, then that means that we're going to allocate the points uh, to our objective, if it's zero, zero times anything is zero, so it won't be a, a part of our objective or a part of the value of the objective. So that's our objective function. We can easily just set that uh, in Groby just by a quick, you know, using the set objective. And uh, uh, a quick sum is is one of the built-in functions that Groby has. There's a, you might see some other ways to do summations and things like that, you know. Some have their their uh, advantages here and there, but you know, just to make things simple, I sort of kept it as quick sum the whole way through. So now let's look at our constraints. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to be selecting one player from each position. So that's our first set of constraints. We need to only select one point guard, only select one shooting guard, one small forward, and so on and so forth. So each each position has its own constraint, saying that if if player I is eligible for that position, sum over all of those possibilities, we can only select one. So we're only allowing one YI to be one, if and to be positive, if if uh, that player is an eligible to be a certain, you know, eligible to be a point guard or eligible to be a center, so on and so forth. So to do that, we sort of loop through each position and say, all right, if if that player is in that position. Let's sum across all of those that, that set of players and impose a constraint that that sum has to be equal to one. So next, our sal uh, the, the next uh, constraint is that's our salary cap. So just as we saw that uh, how you know uh, PI times YI contributes to our objective, the same thing for the salary. We need to make we need to make sure our total salary is less than our threshold, which we have for now as thirty thousand dollars. So we add this constraint as well. Now, to get the answer, to get the solution, all we need to do is just run m.optimize, and you'll see some information about what Groby's doing in the back. Uh, a lot of it is um, not super pertinent at this time, but it does you know, uh, have a lot of information that uh, we have other videos and other resources to help you understand. So um, here, let's look at the solution and what we get um, and who's in our optimal lineup. So the total fantasy score is 171.92 da, 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 points. Um, don't worry about all the decimals, but let's look at who's in there. We have Joel Embiid. Okay, that's that was the player that was that had the highest fantasy points. Um, and I believe Jarrett Jack was one of the players that was uh had the highest ratio so it was like a really good value and dario was close there as well but that's it you know all the other players are just they weren't on that list so we're just we're sort of finding these finding the players for the optimal lineup sort of uh by not using any of those methods so here's just a nice visualization of our uh um our lineup, their predicted fantasy points, their salary, and then we also have their true fantasy points, so what they actually uh, uh, did that day. And we sort of see that you know some of the players did very you know got very close to our predictions, some maybe not so much. That's okay. But um, one of the interesting things is that uh, let's revisit the the names that I mentioned earlier of Jordan Bell and Josh Hart. Those two players, those were the absolute top of 
the sort of the efficiency fantasy points per dollar spent not in our optimal lineup so this shows that even for a simple model considering over two million possibilities arriving at an optimal solution is 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 difficult uh even with you know even when you're using some processes or something that you think would be very intuitive so with the last minute uh, i'm going to switch over to our other part two notebook um, so you may be thinking that, oh, well, this really wasn't a, an actual competition. This was a very simple model. That's fine. We have that taken care of. So in our other notebook, the part two of this, we have a very similar model, but we expanded it in, in two ways. One is that we, and this is to be very representative of competitions that you see like on, on popular websites. What we allowed this time is we allowed... Uh, a player to be assigned to uh, multiple positions because sometimes you can see a player like LeBron James you can set him as a small forward or a power forward or you know a player like Draymond Green can be a center or a power forward additionally uh, we also have um, more slots to fill in the uh, in the competition. So we need things like at least three total guards or at least three power or, or th at least three forwards. And th so this notebook, um, I'll let you go through it at your own pace. Um, but we do have a, you know, we do have uh, ready and available an example that goes through the competitions at a, at a more uh, um, realistic level. So go through this at your own pace, understand it, take a good look at it. Um, it's a real cool um, example. And uh, one other thing, we also sort of highlight one of the, uh, an interesting aspect of, of um, linear programs and uh, something that's called Slack, which is unused sort of constraint, more or less. So we sort of show how to extract that information um, using Groby Pi as well. So hope you enjoyed this example and uh, let's move on to the next one. Thank you, Jerry. That was fascinating. In this part of the webinar, we're going to look at an avocado price optimization example. Let's say you find yourself in this precarious situation where you have control over the avocado supply chain in the U.S. And you know that avocados are a lot of money. So it's a $2 billion industry. So how do you uh, supply the avocados, right? Like how do you set the price of an avocado in the different regions? How do you set the supply to each region? Because we fully well know that the higher the cost of an avocado, the less is going to be your demand. So in this notebook, we're going to look at how to combine a prediction model that predicts demand as a function of price and then use a mathematical optimization model to set the optimal price using this prediction. And we use data that's available from Haas Avocado Board, whose sole mission is to make avocados, the uh, most popular fruit in the country. And they're not very far from achieving that. So in this um, notebook, we're going to look at first predicting the demand using regression and constructing an optimization model using price and supply. Also, this image is courtesy of Dal E AI. If you haven't checked it out, do check it out. In this notebook, we will see uh, an optimization model for setting optimal avocado prices and also how to supply to the different regions. So we'll use data from uh, Haas Avocado Board. And uh, yeah, so in the, there are going to be three parts to the notebook. In the first part, we'll see some relationships between different categories, such as sales and price and uh, how the region and the seasonality affects sales. And, uh, and then the second part, we'll see, uh, we'll build a prediction model for the sales. And uh, so that would be uh, a proxy for demand for the future. So we'll see how the demand uh, depends on, you know, factors such as the price, region, the year, and the seasonality. And finally, we'll construct an optimization model that sets the perfect optimal price for 
uh, the different regions and also decide how much to supply to the different regions uh, using the prediction model. All right, so let's uh, jump right in. First, let's uh, load the data set. Um, this is what we see uh, when we put the data set into pandas. So we have uh, the different regions. So there's eight different regions. And these are broader regions in the US, like Great Lakes, the Northeast, and so on. Um, and we have uh, information on the sales and the average price for every week in each region. And we have uh, two kinds of avocados, the conventional and the organic. Uh, but for this notebook, we'll only focus on the conventional avocados. So yeah, first let's do some preparation of the data set. So here you have um, each year indexed by a number zero through seven. So from 2015 to 2022, you can give it a number. So this, this index will help later on when building the prediction model. Um, we'll also define uh, some months to be peak season. So in every year, some, uh, you know, the sales go up in certain months than the other months. So um, for now we've set it to be February through August because the peak definition kind of varies dif across different regions. So, um, but yeah, you can feel free to try different other months to be the peak season. Let's look at some uh, trends in the data. So over the past few years from 2015 to 2022, um, the sales has typically been going up. You know, uh, I mean, take 2022 with a caveat because it's not, we haven't fully lived 2022 yet. Um, but yeah, overall sales has been marginally going up except for 2019. Um, there's a well-documented uh, shortage, avocado shortage in 2019. If you look at sales within a year, we see um, two peaks in February and May, uh, potentially thanks to the Super Bowl in February and Cinco de Mayo in May, when uh, sales of avocados go higher than, on average higher than the other months. Let's uh, try to understand some correlations between the different categories. So here you have the sales, price, the year, and the peak seasonality. As expected, um, the sales has a negative correlation with the price of an avocado. Um, over the years, there's a positive correlation uh, between year and sales. And uh, it being a peak season, a positively correlates with the sales. We can also see how the different regions have different sales numbers. You can see that uh, the West Coast has the highest sales of avocado, uh, followed by the South Central region. Um, yeah. And this is not per capita, so it could also be an effect of the size of the population. So take this with a pinch of salt. The second part of the notebook looks at how to construct a prediction model for the demand um, as a function of uh, you know, the price, the region, the year, and the peak season. And uh, so this will be, um, the demand basically is a proxy for the past sales. You know? So the idea being how can we uh, estimate how much is gonna be sold in the future and uh, that, yeah, so that's the goal of constructing the prediction model. And uh, we can do this using stats models um, or SK learns. So we use stats models to uh, construct a formula that, that's very intuitively you know, constructed. The advantage is that you can also add some interaction terms to it if you want. You can say, oh, what if I want price times the year as one of the terms? You can easily do that. Um, and yeah, for this we get an R-square close to 0.9, and we're pretty happy with it. Using the prediction model, we'll now construct the optimization model, right? So the goal is to find the price, right price for an avocado in each region, and we want to find how much avocados to be supplied to each region. 
So the parameters are going to be uh, the set of regions and we have a prediction model, a predictor for each region, the sales in each region as a function of price and region. Um, so this is for a particular week in a year. So the, the time and the seasonality are all constants. And we also have a certain finite number of avocados to be di distributed across the regions, right? So this is going to be a constraint that we will eventually add. So yeah, so we have, we know how many avocados to be distributed across the region. And we also know what's the minimum and maximum price per region, minimum and maximum uh, supply per region. And uh, we also know some uh, costs incurred, right? So we have wastage costs. So suppose we supply more than the demand, then uh, uh, we have some wasted avocados. And we also have uh, transportation costs of uh, you know transporting avocados from the southern border to the different regions. So yeah, we can uh, start building the Groby Pi, uh, you know, the Groby model, and uh, we can define the decision variables. So what, what do we want out of the model, right? So we want the price of an avocado in each region. We want to know the supply. And uh, based on these, we can track, track a few other variables. We can track uh, you know, the, the predicted number of models to be sold because uh, you can, uh, you know, as a prediction, you know, the actual sales is gonna be the minimum of the demand and the supply, right? You could, so that's something that we can add as a variable. And, uh, you know, the supply minus sold is gonna be the wasted number of avocados. So we'll also have a variable for that. So we can add these variables to the model and uh, we can also construct the demand function um, using these variables. So here, um, for each region, this is a demand function. So it's gonna be an intercept minus uh, a, you know, a constant times the price. So basically what it means is that in this, the first region, uh, the demand is gonna be seven million avocados. And for every dollar increase in the price, there's gonna be two million less avocados sold. Okay, so it's, so that's that's for each region we have. Um, yeah, so the overall goal is to maximize the net revenue and the revenue is given by the price times the sales, right? So notice that both price and sales are decision variables and therefore this is a quadratic optimization problem. And we also have uh, wastage costs and the transportation costs that, that need to be minimized. So we put the objective in the model and we add a constraint that says the total uh, supply of avocados across the regions should be equal to, you know, the given supply amount. And uh, we have constraints that define the actual sales. So we are selling avocados um, that, you know, that, that cannot be more than either the demand or the supply, right? So the actual sales is going to be the minimum of demand and supply. And that can be enforced using these two inequalities. And we can add these and update the model. And we also have constraints that define the wasted number of avocados. So these are all simple linear inequalities. So this is a very simple model. Um, that's, it's a very simple quadratic program that, that can still be pretty powerful when solved. So we'll see what that looks like. So we set up the problem and we, um, as we know already, we just have to say m dot optimize. And uh, yeah, so the optimal solution looks like this. So across the different regions, what is the price of an avocado? How much are supplied and how much are sold? And there's some wasted predicted demand. Um, so if you visualize, um, you know, the sales per and the price in the different regions, that's what it looks like. Um, let's now experiment with the parameter settings. So let's say we control the total supply using the slider, right? So as we you know, set the supply to be very small, we see that the prices are all set to be $2 in the regions. 
um, and the number of uh, avocados sold is relatively small. As we keep increasing the supply, the actual sales goes up and the price goes down, right? And this is interesting uh, because at some point, um, you know, the wasted avocados start shooting up. So the cross, cross, uh, you know, bars show how much are wasted. So the idea is that at some point we hit $40 million or $41 million net revenue and then we start wasting it. At the same time, if you if you undersupply, you you don't have uh, you don't have as much net revenue as well. So there's a sweet spot in how much avocados to supply. So these are some of the insights we can learn from solving a prediction model on top of a prescriptive model. So yeah, so this notebook wraps up uh, a simple model that integrates prediction and optimization. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul and Jerry, for introducing these new and exciting ways to combine machine learning and optimization through the music recommendation, fantasy basketball, and avocado pricing examples. All the notebooks you saw today will be available online in our example library at garobi.com and will be emailed out to attendees within the next week. But before we finish up and transition into Q&A, I just wanted to let you know about some of the special free opportunities available to academics. We've always been big supporters of academia here at Garobi, and in 2022, we're taking that commitment even further. Wanted to mention just a few of the ways that you can benefit at no cost. So first, Garobi licenses are always free for academics and recent graduates. Be sure to check that out on our website. Second, our optimization experts are available to support you in the classroom. And we do that through guest lectures, workshops, and training opportunities. Finally, please know that we want to keep on spreading the word about innovative projects that academic users in the community are working on with Garobi. If you've got a story to tell or an example to share, you can apply to speak at one of our events or to share one of your examples by reaching out to me directly at academicprogram at garobi.com. We also have a brand new web-based game called the Burrito Optimization Game that introduces learners to the power of optimization. You can play that game for free online or visit the teaching guide by visiting www.burritooptimizationgame.com. These are just some of the ways that Groby works to support the academic community, and you can reach out to me to learn more. So now we've got a few minutes left for Q&A, and we're going to use the Q&A feature. Thanks so much.